If created things are many, then they must certainly be different, precisely because they are many. For it is impossible that many things should not also be different. And if the many are different, it must be understood that their logi, according to which they essentially exist, are also different. Since it is in these, or rather because of these logi, that different things differ. For different things would not be different from each other if their logi, according to which they came into being, did not themselves admit of difference. If then, just as when the senses apprehend material objects in a natural manner, they must, in receiving them, necessarily recognize that the perceptions of these objects, which underlie and are susceptible to their grasp, are many and diverse, so too when the intellect naturally apprehends all the logi and beings, and contemplates within them the infinite energies of God, it recognizes the differences of the divine energies it perceives to be multiple and, to speak truly, infinite. Now it is important to understand at the outset that St. Maximus firmly states that we cannot understand the mystery by which God is both simple and yet present in these diverse ways in his energies and in the logi. In making this video I'm not trying to surpass the limits of what the author has indicated in his work, and it is clear that there are real limits to these apodictic or logical explanations. That being said, I do want to make the positive case from St. Maximus's own writings that the multiplicity of the Logi is real and cannot be explained away by what we may call the identity thesis. This is the notion that everything predicated truly of God is not merely predicated of, but is identical to, the absolutely simple essence, and that there exists nothing uncreated which is distinct from that essence. I do myself believe that the essence is absolutely simple, and cannot be divided in any manner, which is why I believe the essence energy's distinction is necessary, so that we may predicate things of God. This is also why I believe in the distinction between person and nature, because persons are not mere divisions or qualifiers of the essence, which is simple and indivisible. With these clarifications out of the way, let us proceed to examine St. Maximus's statements on the multiplicity and unity of the Logi. In Ambiguum 41, he writes, Accordingly, all creation admits of one and the same absolutely undifferentiated principle, that is, that its existence is preceded by non-existence. Now how could this principle in any way be identical to the divine nature? Simply put, it cannot. Rather, it reflects the mysterious divine plan or counsel of God, which is distinct but not separate from the nature. God wills to create from nothing, and this is the first principle of all created things, which precedes their creation, and it simultaneously indicates their final cause, or telos, to be united with God in a mode that is clearly distinct from the absolutely simple essence. To cite St. Paul once again, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also have we obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Now St. Maximus acknowledges that all creation shares in a transcendent and imminent unity, by virtue of its common principle of having come into being from nothing. 
but that unity is not the divine nature itself. In that sense, we can exclude a reading of the Logi that hinges on a Latin understanding of analogia entis, or the analogy of being. Nevertheless, I think St. Maximus uses the categories of Aristotle in a way that does not limit their signification to substances, but applies some of them to the Logi themselves, in a heuristic way. That is to say, he explains the unity and multiplicity of the Logi in terms that echo Aristotle's use of genera, species and differentiae to account for the unity and multiplicity of essences. I think it is in this context that we should read his statement that, according to the highest form of negative theology, the many Logi are one. If we follow this reading I am suggesting, there is a conventional sense of negative theology here, by which the higher the genus the fewer differentiae accrue to its definition. This significantly plays on the term logos, which signifies a definitional account in Aristotelian metaphysics and logic. Thus, in a manner of speaking, the logi are truly multiple, because in this sense they do accrue differentiae as they proceed from universals to particulars. Yet these differentiae are not accidents as such, because the logi are not substances and are not subject to any change. Rather, these differentiae are the defining limits of creatures' participation in God. Again, I want to stress that in speaking of the Logi in this way, I do not mean to treat them as substances, since they eternally pre-exist substance, both universals and particulars, as I have covered in other videos. Indeed, St. Maximus states in Ambiguum 17, What human being, as I have said, can know the intelligible principles of beings as they are in themselves, and how they are distinct from each other? Who can grasp how they have an immovable natural rest and a natural movement that prevents them from being transformed into one another, or how they have rest in motion and, what is even more paradoxical, their motion in rest? What is the bond that unites things that are diametrically opposed so that they constitute a single world? What is the mode by which their orderly and unconfused movement is governed? Indeed, what, in our own bodies, is this complexion of opposites blended together in a synthesis which brings things separated by nature into an amicable community, subduing by virtue of the mean the severities of the extremes, leading each to inhere within the other without the loss of their integrity, but rather preserving the elements of the synthesis, which is the reciprocal presence of the one extreme in the other by virtue of the blending. Who can say how each of these elements exists and what it is or to where it carries things, or to where it is carried, and for what purpose it comes into being, or carries, or is carried along. And this not simply, as was said a moment ago, in terms of the pre-existing intelligible principles, but with respect to the innumerable modes whereby each one by itself, and again with all the others, is divided and united both in thought and actuality. <laughs>